Uh, today's um, Boston Review, MIT Political Science uh, Joint Ideas Matters uh, Forum. Uh, today's uh, forum is going to focus on the uh, promise of uh, ethical uh, consumption. But before we actually jump into the content, I thought I would just say a few words about how, why do we have these forums? Why, how is it that the Boston Review and the MIT Political Science Department have come together to sponsor a series of events, more or less every month, every other month, on a, a set of key issues? And I think um, we came together um, because the mission of both of these organizations, both Boston Review and MIT Political Science, seems to be quite aligned. And we also felt together that there wasn't really enough opportunity for people to debate and discuss some of the key issues of our time, but in a way that sort of focuses on evidence, on reason, uh, on argument, as opposed to sort of shrill, uh, you know, sound bites, uh, et cetera. Um, Boston Review, as a, as a publication, has been trying to basically promote these kinds of fora for people to debate key issues um, of our times from different perspectives, always focused on uh, argument and evidence, uh, and that's always been a very key feature of, of the publication, in addition to all the other wonderful work uh, that the Boston Review uh, does. Uh, the MIT Political Science Department uh, is, uh, is basically very much aligned with the mission of MIT, and the mission of MIT is to do research and teaching to address the world's great challenges. And the Department of Political Science here at MIT is focused on the study of politics and policies aimed at trying to address these same great challenges, be they uh, issues of climate, uh, uh, energy, uh, poverty reduction, economic development, and uh, in today's issue, trying to understand are there alternative mechanisms, mechanisms based on the market that allow uh, us to shape not just production behavior, but consumer uh, behavior in a way that could lead to uh, poverty reduction, economic development, and more fair practices at the point of uh, production. That's going to be the uh, so that's going to be the topic of today's uh, session. Um, and the moderator uh, of, uh, of this session is uh, Professor Arkan Fung, uh, who is a uh, professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, who has worked on, on these issues as well as others. Uh, and he will uh, be moderating the session as well as introducing the different speakers. And with that, let me uh, introduce uh, Arkan. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. So we're here today to consider the moral and political consequences of our desires and of our consumption. As the enormous literature on glo the globalization of production chains and labor markets shows, the consequences of what buying clothes, food, consumer goods, and just about everything else we buy reaches further and is more bewildering than ever before. So this iPhone was made in a factory in China where more than a dozen people have killed themselves in recent years. The t-shirt that I'm wearing was made in Jordan, and I have no idea what the labor conditions were or what went into growing the cotton or weaving the fabric that it's made of. This morning, I took a multivitamin that I bought at Trader Joe's. Uh, many nutritional supplements are produced very far away and are loosely regulated both at the point of production and the point of consumption. So it's a little bit of a leap of faith for me to think that the pill will do me more good than harm. Karl Marx argued that the relations of production are mystified. Globalization makes the relations of consumption invisible. That invisibility creates moral and political problems. The moral problem is that it's very difficult for us to organize our lives in ways that don't harm other people. If I don't know whether buying this t-shirt or that t-shirt hurts some kid in China, it's hard for me to do the right thing. The political problem is that places where the most harmful production occurs often have states that are unwilling or unable to regulate those harms. If we rely on traditional governmental measures to mitigate the harmful consequences of our consumption, we'll be waiting a long time. So what should we do? We have a distinguished panel here to help us think through that question. That panel is composed of some of the contributors to the New Democracy Forum that appears in the upcoming 2000, uh, November, December 2011 issue of the Boston Review. 
Dar O'Rourke is going to be the first speaker, and I'll introduce him in a moment. After Dara speaks, three other panelists will join us in this exploration of um, ethical cons consumption. Scott Nova is the founding executive director of the Workers' Rights Consortium, an independent labor rights monitoring organization. The WRC aims to combat sweatshops and protect the rights of workers who make apparel and other products. Prior to joining the WRC and forming it, Scott was executive director of the Citizens Trade Campaign. Uh, second after Scott, Jens Heinmuller will speak. He's an assistant professor uh, of political science at MIT and a fellow at the Institute of Quantitative Social Sciences at Harvard University. And his research focuses on statistics and political economy. And then finally, Rick Locke will speak. He is currently head of the Department of Political Science at MIT and class of 1922 professor of political science and management. Um, Rick has appointments both in the political science department and in the Sloan School. His current research is focused on improving labor and environmental conditions in global supply chains, and he works with firms like Nike, Coca-Cola, Hewlett-Packard, and um, uh, Rick has been, and his students have been uh, showing how corporate prof profitability and sustainability can go together. Um, the author of the lead article and our first speaker today is Dar O'Rourke. We have the great pleasure of hearing him. He is the founder of Good Guide and presently its chief sustainability officer and board chairman. Dara, amazingly, also at the same time that he holds this kind of uh, double-time job, is a professor of environmental and labor policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Dara has been working on issues of corporate behavior and labor standards for many, many years. Back in the mid-1990s, his research exposed serious shortcomings in social monitoring practices by examining one specific high-profile case, that is Ernst & Young's inspections of a Nike factory in Vietnam. This report was one of the key sparks that set off a broad wave of concern in universities, workers' groups, and northern and southern civil society groups about labor standards and corporate abuses. Over the last several years, Dara has devoted himself to creating a capacity to allow the rest of us to understand the social, environmental, and health consequences of our consumption. I've, the great, I've had the great pleasure of watching Good Guy grow from an idea in Dara's head to uh, a team of, a tiny team of him and a couple of dedicated Berkeley graduate students, to now a well-capitalized social responsibility startup with more than two dozen scientists, developers, and other staff on its payroll. In order to be consistent with the principle of transparency, I need to disclose to you that I serve on Good Guide's advisory board. I like to think the causal arrow runs the right way. That is, I serve on Good Guide's advisory board because I'm a huge fan and not the other way around. Good Guide's original proposition is that enormous untapped moral and political power lies in the choices of consumers. Consumers will do the right thing if they have the right information and that their choices will change. Their choices for more ethical consumption, in turn, will be a force that is potentially far more powerful than any government regulator. Probably like some other people in this room, I spent some of the last couple of weeks reflecting on the life of Steve Jobs. In a 1995 interview, someone asked him about entrepreneurship. And he said that two things are especially important in entrepreneurship. The first is perseverance, the willingness to work 16 or 20 hours a day. The second is to have an idea, an idea that you're passionate about and that you think will change the world. If you don't have an idea, go pull espresso or maybe work for Microsoft. Dara has both of these qualities in ample measure. Um, then Job said, if you have both perseverance and an idea and the conditions are right, you might be able to change the world. Imagine that the world is a vector. It's going in a certain way, right? People are buying things that make them happy, despite the fact that the things they buy might hurt workers, might hurt the environment, might even hurt themselves. Then someone has an idea that changes that vector just a little bit. Some people, some people a few people, start consuming things in a little bit more ethical way. And at the beginning, it looks like the world is just changing a little bit. But a mile out, right, it's a vector. So a mile out, it's a huge difference from what the world would otherwise be, right? That change is what Good Guide is about. That change is what Dara O'Rourke is about. And that's why it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend Dara O'Rourke and hand over the stage. 
Thanks very much, Arkan. That was an uh, incredibly generous uh, introduction. Um, also, I want to thank the Boston Review and uh, MIT's Political Science Department. As Ricky mentioned, this really is uh, almost unheard of in academia to have this kind of dialogue where someone writes something, has eight super smart people from around the world write responses to it, and then I get to respond again, and we have to have an in get to have an interaction in this way that really almost never happens in the social sciences or the physical sciences, quite frankly, where this kind of interaction with ideas back and forth. I did. I get the last word, Scott. Um, and that is something that really is um, unique and uh, is something that I think is special about Boston Review and about MIT's political science department. So I want to thank both of those and thank Archon again. And we really, in following on what Archon said, we have been working on this project related to ethical consumption for the last several years that really is trying to catch up with some major trends going on in the world and that we're trying to figure out can we build tools that can help to move these market dynamics that we see in a positive direction towards more ethical consumption that may lead to less toxics, less sweatshops, less carbon, less problems of global production that we all know about. We are, I think, at a critical inflection point in the world where we see these problems of climate change, of biodiversity loss, of industrial pollution, of labor rights, human rights, of even obesity that are getting worse and worse and worse. Consumers are key participants and key drivers of many of those problems. And I would argue that they also have a critical role to play in being part of the solution to those problems or part of the answer to responding to them. I think we are entering a new age of radical transparency that will allow new types of market dynamics and new types of consumer individual empowerment and engagement with markets that really never existed before. This image is of a cell phone, of, of that iPhone that Archon mentioned, that now allows any consumer, how many of you do not have smartphones in your pocket? A few. but. The majority in the room now have smartphones. The vast majority of students across America have smartphones. Any consumer can now can walk into a stop and shop and can immediately scan a barcode and find out the environmental, the social, the health impacts of a product while they're standing in the aisle. They can find out where it came from, the company that owns it, how much they paid their CEO, whether or not it has a relationship to a company they don't like. And really, we are entering a, a radical new age where consumers will have gone from the dark ages of knowing basically nothing about products. You walk into a store and you know price and you know brand, moving from that almost complete lack of information to the ability to begin to pierce that veil of marketing to show people about the actual impacts of their choices. At the same time, as we'll show, and hopefully Scott will talk about, workers around the world, including one that Scott helped to found at Alta Gracia, now have Skype capability where they can Skype with consumers in the consuming market. So you can go online and Skype with workers in Alta Gracia. Workers in China and Mexico and Vietnam, where I do work, have smartphones themselves. They have camera phones. They're taking pictures of conditions in factory floors. They're texting to their friends. They're texting to NGOs. Information is getting out from the long stretches of global supply chains back up to us consumers. So there is more potential to access information to find out instantly if products pass or fail our personal ethical filters than ever before really in the history of consumption. Now, unfortunately, we started Good Guide in this experiment based on this failure of traditional regulation, traditional state and intergovernment regulation. This is partly due to complex cross-border supply chains that rapidly move between suppliers, limited transparency, virtually impossible for one national government to regulate the length of these supply chains. And the US government, of course, abdicating most responsibility for these issues over the last several decades. And the places like China that would have the responsibility to regulate Foxconn, the producer of that iPhone, also not doing their job in doing that. So we start from this position, unfortunately, of uh, limited success of state regulation. And we see, is there potential for consumers to play a role, a, a point of leverage over global supply chains? Their, their point at the top of these supply chains, can they play some role that might play essentially a governance role? And there is a long tradition including here in Boston, I'll go back even before Glenn Beck's Tea Party to another Tea Party, that argued that consumers could make a difference. Consumers could send a signal to a government. Uh, and that started a revolution, as you know, from basically 
one consumerist action. We have a long tradition of different attempts to do that. They don't often work, but occasionally bringing individual citizens and consumers in can make a difference. Now, interestingly, again, there are these trends where consumers, more and more of them, say they care. They say they care partly due to all these scandals, the suicides in Foxconn, the lead in toys, the melamine in baby formula and pet food, the bisphenol A in baby bottles. Scandal after scandal has led consumers to say they care. Now, the, the data is overwhelming. 76% of Americans say they consider environmental and social issues when purchasing. 73% say they would pay more for greener, healthier products. 67% say they have actually avoided a product or company in the last year because of an ethical issue. How many of you have avoided a product or company because of a social, environmental, or ethical issue? Almost everyone in the room. Okay, so there is increasing awareness of the problems of global production. People know about these scandals. They're reading about them every day. They're hearing about them on Facebook and Twitter and through the mainstream media. And they are expressing at least their dislike for the bad stuff, wanting to avoid the worst parts of the global economy. There is a broad variation in what we call ethical consumption um, from the largest being USDA organics and fair trade, being the largest, most prominent. But animal welfare, GMOs, environmental attributes, different things. And we can go into all the different variations on it. But the, the broad outlines as we look at the data is there has been a staggering growth in what you would call ethical consumption over the last decade. Organic food from 12 billion in 2005 to 21 billion in 2009 during a period in which the overall food market went flat or down negative. Organic continued to grow 10% per year. Fair trade, 200 million euros in 2000 to 3.4 billion euros this past year. Again, growing 10 to 15% per year while the rest of the market flat or down. Local foods, farmers markets, planting of organic acreage, ethical personal care, green cleaners, Toyota Priuses, across the board on every category we looked at, the sales numbers are staggeringly positive. There is massive growth. Industry, of course, has responded to this. They see this. The introduction of products with green and environmental ethical claims is growing even faster uh, than the sales data. So we see in every category, in food and beverages and personal care, we see new products being labeled this way. All sorts of problems with that we'll talk about. But even more interesting than all these new products to respond to these consumer demands is new businesses, new business models. Again, one which Scott can talk about more. I went over to the coop right beforehand and got myself a new MIT t-shirt. Now, the reason I bought this is partly because of my undying affection for MIT, um, but also um, because this is an Alta Gracia t-shirt that has a picture of one of the workers who made this telling me that my son goes to school because of these clothes. Giving a direct connection between me, the consumer, and the actual workers in the small town of the Dominican Republic that made this shirt, that really, again, I can Skype with them, I can buy this, I can see that they pay triple the minimum wage, they're paying a living wage, the best health and safety conditions in the country, a new kind of relationship with a new kind of company that never really existed before in, in what is you know, one of the most abysmal industries in the world, the global apparel industry. We're seeing new interesting dynamics that are leading to new interesting types of interactions, making the invisible visible, allowing consumers to see that they have a connection and that they can do things. Okay, all that positive news said, there still is a massive gap between what consumers say and what they do. 70% say they want to buy green and healthy and sustainable. About 1% to 5% actually do. Uh, about 50% of Americans avoid bad stuff, but again, only in the 1%, 2 3% intentionally seek out ethical stuff, fair trade, sweat-free, whatever, organic stuff. So there's a huge gap between what uh, economists call the attitudes behaviors gap, the difference between stated preferences and surveys and focus groups and actual purchases. Consumers, as we know, are constrained in many ways. They're constrained by habit. They buy what they always have bought in the past. They're constrained by influences over status. Most of our purchases are not rational purchases, even for you very smart MIT students. You often make purchases based on peer influence, what other people are purchasing. Um, we are continuously manipulated, and all of the technology that is benefiting the NGOs and the activists and us as consumers is also being used against us. Online shopping basically tracks us and manipulates us in all sorts of new ways. Also, in store, new types of manipulation and marketing. And then finally, lack of information. There's all sorts of reasons which consumers are constrained. We see, in looking at this, a need for consumers to have better information while they're actually making decisions, so contextually relevant information in a store, online, when they're making a decision, that shows them the impacts of their decisions. It shows like this that my purchase can actually help someone or stop something bad or make something better. It's critical that it shows 
we show that people like you are doing it. This is the strongest driver of consumer decision making in the U.S. is that people like you do it. So peer influence is critical. It has to be simple, easy, and empowering. And we hope that it also can be an on-ramp, individual purchase decision can be an on-ramp to collective action, from individual action to collection, collective action, individual to social action. So uh, this is all basically the setup for this experiment that we launched at UC Berkeley and spun out into an independent um, social venture called Good Guide, which seeks to be a platform for transparency into the environmental, social, and health impacts of products and companies, and ultimately to empower individuals to make better decisions in the marketplace. And by better, I mean both scientifically better, that they have better data behind their decisions about toxics or labor rights or climate change, but also that it better matches their own values. We're trying to build tools that allow people to match their own values in the marketplace. The first uh, instance of this is a website, goodguide.com, which is the kind of starting point of, of what we've done. Um, and that is, we are now rating 140,000 products across about a dozen categories for their environmental, their social, and health performance. We rate both the company and the product behind the company. Um, we have tried 20 different things on this user interface, on a rating system, on all sorts of different things from five stars to thumbs up, thumbs down, to A through F, to all sorts of different things. Right now we're using a 10 point scale. We rate, give a health score of the product, an environmental score of the product and the company, and a social score of the company. Um, we have basically, as Archon said, built a team, started off with academics. Now it's a team of 25 scientists and engineers, chemists, toxicologists, environmental life cycle assessment experts, sociologists, nutritionists that are doing this work to evaluate all the way down to the individual chemical ingredients in any food product you were buy or your shampoo you wore, used this morning or uh, whatever, detailed information uh, down to the ingredient level, information on uh, toxics releases from the factories that produce the product, EPA fines and violations, OSHA fines and violations, state attorney general's lawsuits, uh, recalls, as I said, how much do you pay your CEO? Do you have women and minorities in senior management positions? Do you test on animals? We're now rating these products across about 1,500 different criteria by which we can evaluate a product and the company. In each category that we look into, we use these approaches from life cycle assessment to try to identify the hot spots, what matters most scientifically in the assessment of the category. So rating a t-shirt is very different than rating a box of cold cereal, is different than rating an iPhone. We want to know what matters most. Where are the big environmental impacts or big health impacts or big social impacts? Get the best available data on that and then get it out to consumers in an easy form. We want to get this out at the moment of decision. So we move from web to mobile on your iPhone, on your Android phone. At the moment you're in a store, still 95% of consumption in the U.S. happens in brick and mortar stores. It's not online. And we're trying to do something which in the lexicon of Silicon Valley is we're trying to connect who you trust, your social graph, your friends, your family, the NGOs you may be members of, the academics you may trust, with your interest graph, what you care about, what matters to you, what issues are you concerned about, and to provide that information right when you're making a decision. All fully personalized so you can filter for what you care about. You can set your own screens and say you care about climate change. Uh, someone else can say they care about labor rights, and you can be finding different products or companies that match your values. And really trying to get this out where people shop. So again, as I said, started on goodguide.com. Now we're moving out. We have a toolbar plugin, for instance, that when you're shopping on amazon.com or walmart.com or target.com or diapers.com, across the bottom of your screen, without their permission, we can now rate these products and tell you do they pass or fail your filters. So Amazon may be paid to promote Vaseline, which they often are, and they're behaviorally targeting you. And there's ads following you across the web trying to get you to buy this. We want you to know, does this product pass or fail your filter, your values, your ethics, and give you a simple thing. This one fails. Here are products that pass. Go find those products. Um, we're also trying to build feedback loops. This is kind of, in simple terms, the kind of, if any of you have driven in a Prius, the Prius screen, the dashboard that gives you instant feedback on how your decisions affect your fuel efficiency and your ultimately your emissions. Uh, we have built what, uh, again, in the Silicon Valley terms, is the mint.com for products. Have any of you used mint.com for your financial purchases? Not many. Check it out. So basically the idea is you can um, go into Good Guide, tell us what you care about, set your filters, tell us where you shop, 
Um, and if, again, if you'll opt in, we'll suck in every purchase you've ever made on Amazon or on drugstore.com or on Safeway.com and then evaluate those and tell you do your products you've purchased pass or fail your filters and then tell you products that are better than the ones you've looked at and also products that are cheaper than the ones you've looked at. So this myth that only green healthy products uh, are super expensive, we want to get past that and show, okay, if this is what you care about, you tell us what you care about, we want to help you find better products and ultimately better prices because we know that's what matters to consumers. This has been a painful three-year lesson for me as an academic that presenting pure scientific data to consumers does not convince them of almost anything. And this is unfortunately a lesson that the NGO community should learn, right? Proving once again that climate change is occurring is unlikely to change many consumers in their actual daily lifestyles and their choices, right? That's not the issue. The issue is providing them information that can help them make better decisions and move them towards um, decisions that are greener, healthier, safer, et cetera. So we've learned a lot. Changing consumers is very difficult. Uh, it's critical to try to give a new view, like the Alta Gracia story or our story, of visibility of all that was invisible behind these supply chains, the invisibility in your iPhone, the things you didn't know about. People need to know that their decisions have an impact, that people like them are doing it and it actually makes a difference, and that um, we have been increasingly been trying to bring um, what ec academics call behavioral economics, behavioral psychology, Silicon Valley calls game dynamics, trying to bring in other techniques besides the presentation of factual information to help people basically learn from each other, watch, compete, get status, get the kind of benefits that actually drive mainstream consumption out of this kind of information. We're really now trying to figure out how we make this simple and easy for consumers to use, uh, for individuals to use, to make it valuable so they can actually live better, healthier, more sustainably, but also ultimately that we can help them move from individual action to collective action. We see the real potential not in me switching from that Vaseline to some other thing, but in all of us together telling Vaseline to get toxic chemicals out of their product or whatever, or telling some company to get sweatshops out of the supply chain or whatever. Um, I'm making a strong argument today for consumers, and, and this is not to say that we think consumers are the only answer, but that they can complement state regulation, intergovernment regulation, governance strategies, NGO strategies, but that they, I would argue, do not crowd out those strategies, but rather can be complementary to them, and that we need to think constructively about how we take these dynamics of market transparency and consumer empowerment and really leverage them within the great work that's going on with global NGOs, with global advocacy campaigns, with global governance initiatives to try to drive the market towards something that is not only more transparent, not only more accountable, but ultimately more ethical and more sustainable. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, first of all, to Boston Review and MIT Political Science for inviting me to this event, and thanks to Boston Review for inviting me to comment uh, on Dara's important article. Um, I want to begin by saying that I agree that ethical consumption has significant potential to affect the situation of workers around the globe in producing in the supply chains of major brands and retailers, and indeed, we know that consumers will act on their concerns about the social responsibility and specifically the labor practices of consumer products brands because it is that consumer concern in the 1990s that led, for all intents and purposes, to the creation of the contemporary discourse of corporate social responsibility. Activists convinced Nike, convinced Gap, convinced other major apparel brands that they could turn consumers away from those brands because of the association of those brands with sweatshop conditions. And that led those brands for the first time to acknowledge that they are responsible for what happens to workers at their contract factories and to promise to do something about labor rights abuses at those factories. Unfortunately, and it's important to, to look at this, to look at this background, to look at the last uh, close to 20 years of the implementation of industry programs around social responsibility because 
I think there's some very significant lessons uh, for that should be applied uh, to the burgeoning field of ethical consumption. So despite nearly two decades of promises from high-profile corporations, global manufacturing supply chains continue to be defined by sub-poverty wages, by substandard working conditions, and by the near total repression of workers' right to act collectively to improve those circumstances. From Nike and Adidas to Walmart and Target, from Mattel and Hasbro to Apple and Hewlett Packard, we have heard and continue to hear the same claims about deep commitments to corporate social responsibility. And we continue to observe the same real world results, the perpetuation of the exploitative and brutal status quo. Take the issue of wages, one that is obviously of central importance to workers and their families. In numerous countries that are key links in the supply chains of major global brands and retailers, real wages for manufacturing workers are lower today than they were a decade ago. In others, growth has been anemic at best. We cannot identify a single country in the global south that is a key link in the supply chains of apparel and other consumer products brands where the wages paid to manufacturing workers are more than, a, more than a small fraction of a living wage. What are these wages? A few examples. In Bangladesh, 21 cents an hour. In India, 40 cents an hour. In Cambodia, 30 cents an hour. Closer to home in the Dominican Republic, about 80 cents an hour. And about 70 cents an hour in Guatemala. And in China, where tens of millions of workers make apparel, toys, electronics, and other products for virtually every consumer products brand you can name, Wages in light manufacturing, which have grown somewhat, are still on average around 60 to 70 cents an hour. How do these wages compare to a living wage? In every one of the countries I've listed, a living wage, conservatively defined, is at least three times the prevailing wage for manufacturing workers. In some countries, like Bangladesh, the ratio is far higher. Let's contextualize these wages. Using purchasing power parity data calculated by the World Bank, which equalizes for differences in cost of living between countries, we can gain an understanding of the quality of life these wages can buy, translated into US terms. What does it mean to earn 80 cents an hour in the Dominican Republic? It's the equivalent of about $1.10 an hour in the US. That's $2,300 a year, less than $200 a month. So I'd ask you to consider for a moment what it will be like to live in Cambridge or Boston on $200 a month having to clothe, feed, and house a family on that budget. Reflect for a moment on what your life would be like. And you'll have a rough idea of what life is like right now for tens of millions of people around the world who make things for the world's leading consumer products brands who are dependents of the people who do. Consider of equal importance the fact that even in the face of this reality, and despite efforts all around the world by workers to organize unions in order to improve these absurdly low wages, Legitimate unions are virtually non-existent in these factories, despite a decade and a half of codes of conduct and corporate promises about protecting labor rights. Because of the swift and brutal repression still visited by managers upon any worker who emerges as a trade unionist or leader of worker protest, collective bargaining, for all intents and purposes, does not exist in global manufacturing supply chains. It is so rare as to be irrelevant for the purpose of any broad analysis. And just to provide one interesting example, Cambodia, where about 300,000 workers make apparel for US and European apparel brands, uh, there's been a more than decade-long project by the ILO, which is supposed to have made Cambodia into a leader in terms of labor rights. Uh, the progress uh, in the country, in our view, has been grossly exaggerated. But I want to talk specifically about collective bargaining, again, after a decade of work supposedly intended to improve respect for worker rights in this specific area. A colleague of ours who runs the key labor rights NGO in Cambodia informed us in a meeting last week with the ILO that there is one collective bargaining agreement out of roughly 600 factories producing apparel in Cambodia that includes wages above the legal minimum. One collective bargaining agreement that has actually raised wages for workers. And the increase in that collective bargaining agreement relative to the legal minimum is $1 per month. Situated between the American consumer and the stark reality I've described is a thick fog of obfuscation. 
generated by the well-resourced and highly sophisticated public relations apparatuses of global corporations. Every major brand and retailer has a code of conduct and a labor rights monitoring program. Every one of them is a devotee of corporate social responsibility and multi-stakeholder dialogue. Every one of them is in one or another organization supposedly dedicated to promoting respect for the rights of workers. Every one of them is pursuing all sorts of very responsible sounding projects and initiatives. And all of it has amounted to precious little in terms of real improvements in wages and conditions and the lives of workers. But all of this endeavor has been quite successful in one respect, shaping the viewpoints of many journalists, politicians, academics, and other opinion leaders, many of whom have been convinced by global brands that these brands are making a sincere effort on labor rights, that the brands are on the job, and that progress, however slow, is being made. And this success leaves the public woefully uninformed about continuing realities, and it takes a lot of pressure off of the brands. Time is too short to present much by way of example of how these corporate social responsibility initiatives operate, but I want to give you one example that nicely en encapsulates the dynamics. Walmart has an initiative launched last year in Bangladesh to, and I quote, empower female factory workers. Because as we all know, if there is one thing Walmart is dedicated to, it is the empowerment of women. <laughs> this initiative, which gains significant media coverage, is one modestly effective tactic in a broader and increasingly effective effort by Walmart to clean up its image as a profiteer of low-wage labor in the U.S. and sweatshops abroad. In terms of actual content, however, the program is meaningless. In a country in which more than 300,000 workers make products for Walmart, most of them women, this program provides, assuming it is doing what Walmart claims, life skills training to a grand total of 2,500 women. The cost of the program is less than the value of the clothes that Bangladeshi workers produce for Walmart in half an hour. As everyone in Bangladesh is well aware, if Walmart genuinely wanted to empower women workers, it would raise their wages above the semi-starvation level and let them join unions. Needless to say, those initiatives are not on Walmart's social responsibility agenda. The fakery and the lack of real progress is by no means limited to apparel. Not to speak ill of Steve Jobs, who was, I think we can all agree, an extremely wealthy man. The reality is that Apple's enormous profits are built on a foundation of low wages and abusive and regimented working conditions that have led to the spate of suicides, among other problems uh, that was referenced earlier. But not to worry. Apple has a code of conduct. It is monitoring its factories, and it participates in corporate social responsibility initiatives. So everything is OK. Against this backdrop of continued exploitation and abuse, masked by ever more sophisticated corporate fakery, we are witnessing the burgeoning of the concept and practice of ethical consumption. As I said, I believe ethical consumption has the potential to be of real value to workers struggling for better wages and conditions. But I'm concerned, as are many labor rights advocates, that ethical consumption will instead end up being defined by the same giant gap between corporate claims and workers' reality that exists in the world of corporate social responsibility. There are four essential concerns. First, that vague, shifting, and or non-existent standards and minimal regulation and oversight can allow companies to market as socially responsible products whose manufacture differs in no meaningful way from the sweatshop norm. Deceptive claims may very well become the rule, not the exception in the ethical products market. We're already seeing a lot of this, a range of products making vague claims with no transparency or clear standards. Another key concern, that the standards setters themselves will make things worse by establishing standards that fall short of any reasonable definition of ethical production. The problem here is that it is much harder to operate a supply chain with truly decent factories where workers are paid a living wage, where there is an aggressive and robust approach to worker safety, where managers are retrained to forget past practice, and to start treating workers like human beings, where workers can join a union without fear of retaliation. It's much more difficult, much more expensive to do this than it is to find factories that are marginally better than the norm, cleaner looking, somewhat better run, willing to make some cosmetic improvements, and putting an ethical label on the products those factories produce. To do that does not require restructuring supply chains. It doesn't require going to the expense of actually paying people a decent living wage. When standard setters negotiate with brands, large and small, they will be told again and again that fundamental change is too hard, 
that it's not possible, that insisting on it will kill the project, that the brands won't participate if the standards are too high. And the concern is that the standard setters will buckle and put in place standards that rebrand above average sweatshops as model factories and that put labels like fair trade on products made by workers paid the same sub-poverty wages as their counterparts at every other factory. And we are seeing exactly this right now in the United States with Fair Trade USA's efforts to create a U.S. standard for fair trade apparel. Over the objections of a broad range of labor rights advocates, unions, student leaders, and others, and unable to win support from their industry partners for a true living wage standard, Fair Trade USA has chosen a wage standard whose only enforceable requirement is the legal minimum wage. The same standard, by the way, in Walmart's Code of Conduct and Nike's. Living wage under their program is mere aspiration. And we have begun to see what this means in action. A staff member of ours visited two factories in India recently on a tour organized by Fair Trade USA. One produces for a brand people may have heard of called Hey Now, which Fair Trade USA has given a Fair Trade label, and which furthermore claims on its website that it pays a living wage. The actual wages, barely above the legal minimum, about 41 cents an hour a wage that consigns the workers at this fair trade factory to a life of grinding poverty. The other factory pays comparable wages. It's worth noting in that case that the factory defended the wages by sharing with the delegation its own living wage analysis in which the factory had concluded that a living wage in India is 32 cents an hour, and therefore they were actually paying more than a living wage. I want to stop for a moment and, and talk very briefly about the project called Alta Gracia that Dara mentioned. How are we on time? Okay. Um, Alta Gracia is an apparel brand created specifically for the university logo apparel market, university logo t-shirts and sweatshirts. The brand was created uh, under an agreement between our organization, Knights Apparel, which is a leading producer of collegiate apparel, uh, and Fedo Tresonis, a trade union federation in the Dominican Republic. And the agreement was to open a factory in the Dominican Republic to produce this product based on a commitment by the brand that the factory would pay a living wage, which we calculated at roughly three and a half times the prevailing apparel wage in the Dominican Republic, that the factory would accept unionization without resistance, and that it would be entirely transparent in enabling us and other outsiders to verify that it's actually uh, fulfilling the labor rights obligations it's accepted. Doing this was not easy. In order to achieve a 350%, a wage 350% higher than the prevailing wage, Knights Apparel had to agree to buy everything the factory produces and to pay substantially more to the factories for the products. This is exactly the model we advised Fair Trade USA years ago. They would have to implement if they were serious about living wage. And of course, their industry partners refused and they went with their minimum wage standard instead. Alta Gracia is the only factory we know of in the Global South, producing apparel for the U.S. market where workers are paid a genuine living wage. Rating systems like Good Guy, if they do nothing else, should first and foremost at least help us distinguish between the fakers and the real projects that represent fundamental change for workers. And I want to say that Good Guide is by far the most sophisticated and useful example of a rating system that we've ever encountered. Uh, and I know that, that Dara and the folks at Good Guide want to make it a useful tool for consumers and are dedicated to getting it right. But on apparel, Good Guide is not getting it right. This brand I mentioned, Hey Now, whose workers are being paid a sub-poverty wage in India, actually gains a higher social rating, not environmental, not on health, a higher social rating than Alta Gracia, a factory that has enabled workers to transform their lives and their families' lives simply by paying a decent wage. And this is another danger, that rating systems will fail to take into account absolute as opposed to relative standards, that they will tend to grade on a curve, and that this will have the effect of making brands that are doing very little look like they're doing a fair amount. That these systems will end up giving brands credit for things that aren't real. For example, Good Guide credits brands for issuing corporate social responsibility reports. In our view, the primary function of those reports is not to inform, but to mislead consumers. We think a brand should be debited 
for issuing propaganda, not credited for issuing propaganda. And without getting into a lot of detail and, and in the interest of time, in order for these rating systems to be meaningful, to be useful, to be productive for consumers, they have to be true to the basic political reality in which they operate. And if a system cannot recognize the distinction between a factory that pays workers a decent living wage and a factory that pays a sub-poverty wage, then there's something wrong with the system. So the, and the, the, the fourth concern I want to express is the danger that by moving forward uh, with ethical consumption, by taking steps that will provide more choice to consumers in terms of ethically labeled products, that we will achieve progress in very small ways that will be used by consumer products companies to fool people into thinking that there's been broad progress. In other words, brands with abusive conditions in their supply chains and sub-poverty wages in their supply chains will get so much credit for small initiatives in the field of ethical consumption that way they will effectively relieve themselves of pressure for broader change. We're worried about this, to be frank, in the context of Alta Gracia as a project, exactly because it's so small. And so on the one hand, it is clear that consumers will respond on these issues. It is, it is clear that there is enormous potential for consumers to drive brands and retailers in the direction of more just supply chains. But we have a great deal of information to consider in terms of the history of corporate social responsibility in the apparel and other sectors. And we need to look to the lessons from that history to ensure that ethical consumption does not become just another means for brands to pull the wool over consumers' eyes. Thanks. All right, great. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Jens Hammer. I'm an assistant professor at uh, MIT in the political science department. And I'm excited to be part of this panel because I think today you're really getting some of the very best people in this area uh, who are doing work and looking at these very, very uh, important issues. Um, and so I can learn a lot from them, but I also hope that we'll get the chance later on to learn from you or what you ideas have or the questions that you think are important that should be answered. I would like to use my time to talk to you a little bit about the research that my team has been doing uh, on consumer demand for uh, ethically labeled products. Uh, I'm coming to this as a political scientist who's really uh, fairly excited about these new schemes of uh, ethical consumptions where sort of there's increasing opportunities for customers to reward good company behavior in the marketplace and to sort of vote with their shopping dollars to try to make a, a difference in the world. Uh, but as I see it, there are sort of two fundamentally and I think yet very uh, sort of unanswered questions out there. The one is about ethical production and the one is about ethical consumption. I think on the ethical production side, one very important question that's out there is whether these approaches, these new ethical supply chains are actually delivering. Whether they're delivering in terms of actually producing better returns, whether they're actually leading to better working standards, whether these green products are actually improving the environment, or whether you, when you buy a fair trade certified product, whether you are actually making a positive contribution to the income of marginalized farmers in the global south. And I think at least when you think about it from sort of a scientific rigorous standpoint, I think the evidence that these approaches deliver, the jury is still very much out on that. And so part of the research that my team is doing and also that Rick is doing is trying to build scientific studies around the efforts of companies where they're setting up ethical supply chains and trying to get measures of what the actual impacts are. And uh, I think right now we have a, a study in the field where we're looking at the impact of fair trade certification to see whether fair trade is actually any better for farmers that participate in these schemes than conventional forms of trade. And so far, like, we'll see what the answer is going to be. But I think we don't really know yet. If you look at the existing evidence, there's a lot of claims that these approaches deliver. Uh, but as Scott uh, pointed out, like, it's not necessarily clear that they're actually producing uh, results yet. So I think that's a very big, important question on the production side. I'm not going to talk much about that today, but I just want to point it out, and maybe we can get into this during uh, Q&A. Today, I want to talk about the second side, which is the consumption side of things. And as, um, as Dara pointed out, I think the key question there is really because often these ethical purchases only really make a very, very small difference in order for this approach to have a big, lasting impact on the planet, what really has to be the case is that there's enough consumers out there that really care about where products come from and how they're actually being made. And again, if we look at the existing evidence on this, 
uh, this is very much an open question. There's a vivid debate out there, uh, and there's many participants, but there's not that much evidence that we have. I just point to two examples here uh, that came out recently to just highlight the range of opinions we have on this. On the one side, we have Time Magazine, which recently ran this cover, proclaiming the rise of the ethical consumer. Okay? And so they were very excited about this. The authors in these articles, they're citing very much exactly the same survey data uh, that Dara showed us, which says that like, there's tons of consumers out there who say they want to support ethical products in the marketplace. They're willing to pay more for them. They're willing to, to, to support them. Uh, and they're pointing to these rapid growth rates of schemes of uh, politicized consumption. Um, and they're saying, well, this is really, this is something new. This is fundamentally going to change the way we do business in the future. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of skeptics out there. And this is well exemplified by this recent book by Devini and a bunch of co-authors. Uh, which is entitled The Myth of the Ethical Consumer, where basically they're reading the evidence in a very different form. They're saying, well, they may be growing at rapid rates, but if you look at fair trade today, it's really ridiculously small. Like purchases of fair trade coffee, for example, are about 1 40th in terms of market share of organic coffee. And organic coffee is already pretty small. And they're basically saying, based on the evidence they're seeing so far, customers care just as they always done. They care about price, they care about quality, and that's pretty much about it. So if you're telling me that there's these ethical considerations which are really playing a role, uh, you're just fundamentally mistaken. And they sum this up in their book by saying the ethical consumer is a myth, an idealized fiction supported by neither theory nor fact. Okay? And so I think it's very important for us academics to maybe get into this debate and try to come up with a little bit of uh, more rigorous evidence than just these sort of left and right uh, bashing kind of debates here. Um, so the way that my research team has tried to approach this question is that we very quickly recognize that it's very, going to be very hard to get at this by uh, doing yet another focus group or running yet more uh, surveys because there's this big gap between attitudes uh, and actions. And so we fairly quickly settled on uh, this approach of using field experiments because ideally what we want to know is how do customers behave in actual stores when they're doing actual purchasing uh, behavior. And from a scientific perspective, it's also very important that we can actually isolate the customers buying products because of their ethical attributes. There's many reasons why customers buy products. Could be because they like the price, could be because they like the quality. So if somebody buys a fair trade certified product, it's not necessarily clear that he's doing that because he's interested uh, in fair trade certification or the positive ethical things that may or may not uh, come with this. Uh, field experiments allow us to isolate uh, these effects by using labeling tests. And so today I'll talk about three of these field experiments that we ran uh, recently that span a wide range of uh, ethical labels looking at an impact of a fair trade label and then a, a label that focused on environmentalism and then also fairness message which looks at uh, fair labor uh, standards. So the first experiment that we ran was the experiment that we started out with where we thought, okay, a good place to start to study ethical consumption to see whether customers are in stores voting with their shopping dollars is to start with looking at demand for the fair trade certified label. Because arguably, as Dara pointed out, this has been one of the most successful and most widely known uh, ethical consumption schemes out there. And, and to do that, we partnered with Whole Foods Markets and we settled on bulk coffee, which is sold in these nice looking bulk coffee bins uh, as the test product. We thought this is a good place to start because bulk coffee or coffee in general is the most successful fair trade certified product. And also these coffee bins, as it turns out, lend themselves very nicely to experimentation. So what we did is we partnered with Whole Foods uh, and we devised this test where we randomly assigned the stores into a treatment and a control group. In the treatment stores, what we did is we put this two by two inch fair trade certified label onto the bulk coffee bins. And in the control stores, we put an equally looking, equally sized placebo label, which is kind of equally attractive, uh, but has no ethical claim to it. And then we used this on two of the widest selling um, fair trade certified coffees in Whole Foods, and we sold the coffee exactly the same price in the treatment and the control stores. We implemented this experiment in the 26 stores in the northeast region of the Whole Foods stores. You can see the stores here. The red ones are the treatment stores. The blue ones are the control stores. So you can see a lot of them are centered around the Boston area. So if you have been shopping at Whole Foods and if you drink coffee, maybe you participated in one of our experiments. And so thank you very much for your contribution to to knowledge, uh, just to point out, nobody was harmed, okay? So the coffee that we sold under placebo was actually fair trade certified, okay? So we, we just deprived you of knowing, uh, of feeling good about uh, doing the right thing. And so we had these labels in place for about eight weeks uh, under treatment and control. After four weeks, we switched over in each of the stores so that we can compare within and uh, across stores. 
And because we did the random assignment, we can be sure if the sales are different under the fair trade label than they are under the placebo label, then it is because customers are voting with their shopping dollars and, and, and voting to support these ethical products in the marketplace. So here I'm plotting on the x-axis the change in the percentage sale under the fair trade label over the placebo label. And let's take a quick snap hole. So who thinks the, effect, the, the sales are higher under the fair trade label than they are under the placebo label? Okay, some, some cautious optimism. Who thinks the sales are about the same? Who thinks the sales are actually lower under the fair trade certified label? Nobody? Okay, fairly optimistic. So once we got the data back, um, we were positively surprised. It turns out that there seems to be fairly strong support for the fair trade certified label, at, le at least among this segment uh, of uh, shoppers. So this uh, dot here points the, uh, the estimate of the average effect in sales. So what this tells us is that average sales increased by about 10% under the fair trade label over the placebo label, which in the world of marketing <coughs> is actually a fairly large effect. And these uh, width of the bar here give you an, uh, sort of some sense of the uncertainty around uh, that estimate. So quite a significant increase under the fair trade label over the placebo label. And as you can see, this increase was stable among the two test coffees that we tried. One of them was a little bit more expensive uh, than the other one. So quite uh, significant support here. And I'm happy to talk more about the generalizability of this uh, experiment to other kind of shoppers. But at least here, there seems to be some strong support out there. Now, what about other types of labels? The second thing we thought is, well, let's look at an environmental label. Let's look at whether customers would support green products in the marketplace. And for that, we partnered with Gap Inc. And we decided to run an experiment in their Banana Republic stores, which are these fairly upscale fashion stores that I'm sure many of you know. And we set it on denim jeans as the test product, which is f sold for about $70 in women's and men's in these stores. The jeans were well suited for this experiment because they had been part of a new initiative by Gap Inc. where the water that's been used to wash and dye the jeans was recycled and removed of chemical pollutants before it was uh, transmitted back into the environment. And they hadn't advertised that environmental property of their uh, product to their customers yet. And so we asked them, their marketing team, to just come up with marketing messages. We used three groups for this design. Where, again, we randomly, designed, uh, randomly assigned the stores into these three groups. One group is the control group, which is not shown here, where there was no specific message uh, placed next to the test products. It was just their standard uh, sort of marketing in the stores. Then we asked them to come up with a fashion message, which is how they usually market products. And then we also asked them to come up with a green message, like at least their best pitch of uh, how this green uh, property of the product could be marketed. And so this is what they came up with. This says, get your blues on in a green way, help fight water pollution. Our denim collection is made under strict guidelines to ensure that the water used in washing and dyeing is safe and clean before it is released into the environment. Okay, and so we think it's a fairly weak test. It's just about clean water. It doesn't tap into other, maybe more salient dimensions of, of green labels such as climate change. And it's also just a claim that the company is making. Okay, so maybe you're with Scott and you just say, well, it's like, why should I believe this? It may not be true. Okay, it's not backed up by a third party certification scheme or any other uh, monitoring. This is the sample that we use for this experiment. We implemented this in all Banana Republic stores in the United States. There's 419 of them. So we get fairly broad coverage. And you can see the different colors for the different groups. Again, because of the random assignment, we can be sure that any changes that we see in sales must be attributable to uh, the labels. And so let's take another snap poll. Who thinks that this label is going to lift sales? Who, who thinks the fashion label is going to be more effective? OK, sort of mixed. Who thinks there's not going to be any effect? Okay. So what we find is the answer is somewhere in the middle. Okay? It turns out that it somewhat depends on the gender. Okay? So for women, what we find is that we uh, had a very significant effect of the green label, which raised sales by about 8 uh, to 9%. And that is statistically significant. The fashion message also lifted sales. But we can't really say that one of them is more effective than the other. That difference is not statistically significant. But both of them lifted uh, sales quite a bit. For men, on the other hand, the green label turned out to have no significant effect on sales, <laughs> while the fashion message okay, still raised sales. So not to insult anybody, but this already tells us that probably not the, the ethical consumer is not everywhere, okay? but there are certain segments of, of shoppers which are more uh, attuned to this. Now, the next question we asked is, well, this is Banana Republic, so it's fairly upscale. Maybe we cover the entire nation, but maybe Let's go to more an, an environment that's maybe more outlet, more retail, where there's very price sensitive shoppers that are looking for. Those are the 
So we replicated the exact same experiment to get out of source in the entire United States using the exact same messaging, but we sold exactly the same genes for forty dollars instead of seventy dollars. And there we find absolutely no effect, neither from the new message in the discussion. They suggest that for the lower market price segment they they don't really uh, pay attention to any label or at least they don't want to be doing product in this kind of output environment. All right, this is environmentalism. Now, last but not least, we also want to see whether customers will be reacting to messaging about the working condition. Now, this is also an important concern in sweat shops. And so we, again, partner with Gapping, this time using their Banana Republic factory stores, which, again, is an environment where price-sensitive shoppers usually go to get, get bargains. We want to make it a hard test. And we used three different test products. One of them was a $130 women's linen suit. Then there was an $80 yoga pant and a $10 men's t-shirt to get a broad range of prices. This was the message that we asked the marketing team to come up with. There was, again, three groups. There was a control group, and then there was a standard testing message, and then there was our sales message, which was highlighting um, just a generic statement about safety and, and, and fairness. So what they're saying is, so hold on. <laughs> they're saying the socially conscious capital suit, this suit is part of our commitment to promoting fair and safe working conditions, so feel good about what we wear. Okay, so again, it's a claim that the company is making. It's not necessarily clear that we should believe it, and it's not backed up by any external monitoring, and it's a fairly detailed uh, environment. So we didn't really expect that much of effect going into this. We again implemented this in all the narrow public factory stores in the entire United States, with 110 of these stores. And, and the results that we found were quite interesting. What we found is that for the women's in the suit, at $130, the fairness message was actually the most effective in raising sales. So it raised sales by uh, about 14 percentage points, which is actually that's a very strong uh, increase in the marketing world, while the fashion message had no significant effect, uh, which indicates that maybe in a higher price market segment for women, this is where people are paying more attention to these technical attributes of the product. For the two lower price items, again, there was uh, absolutely no effect. Again, sort of pointing to some clear limits in the so to sum up, what we find now, the truth is clearly not that like everybody's going to be an email ethical consumer and that this is just all the problems we have in the world. But it's also not the case that the ethical consumer is a myth. It's clearly out there somewhere. Uh, and we find strong support here uh, for the fair trade service, but there's some support from our members and some uh, pretty strong support for these working conditions. And so we did a bunch of more experiments changing prices, for example, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that as well. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, uh, thank you, for everyone, for coming to this uh, to the event. And it's really wonderful to be here. Especially wonderful to actually be participating in a panel with uh, people whose work I've admired uh, for for so many uh, years. And um, since this is basically to discuss uh, the themes that have been provoked by Dar's uh, article in the Boston Review. I want to say that I am an enormous fan of Dara's work, both the research that he's been doing over the last decade or so, as well as uh, the application of that research. I mean, I think that these issues of transparency, accountability, how to get, how to use information to drive positive change is something that Dara and Archon and uh, David and others have been working on for decades, and it's so wonderful to be put in practice through uh, through Good Guy. Um, and um, I just want to say that I'm a big fan of that, but the point that I want to raise is I don't think that uh, ethical consumption in and of itself is going to really tackle uh, the enormous labor problems that we see in uh, global uh, supply chains. Um, and that's the argument that I want to make uh, for some of the reasons that were articulated by uh, Scott, but some other reasons which are different. Because I guess the argument that I want to make in my talk is that while uh, trying to insist on a living wage is important, while trying to sort of signal uh, to consumers and hopefully through that signaling drive behavior, consumption patterns, uh, towards more ethical uh, goods is also uh, very important. It's not enough. And what really has to change is the, is the structure of consumption in the societies we live in. That essentially, that as long as we insist on having the latest iPhone at the cheapest price and as soon as it comes out, which is basically every eight months, you know, that's the life cycle of a consumer electronic, and, and we want it right away, on time, at a cheap price, we are, in fact, contributing 
to the kinds of labor problems that exist uh, in these global supply chains. It's not just that it's bad for the planet because we're buying all this stuff that eventually has to end up in landfill. It's also bad for issues of social justice. And while all of the programs that we've been talking about certainly help, and they definitely help, um, I want to uh, argue today that they're just uh, enough, and that's because of the uh, structure of uh, consumption. So the big problem is why do we continue to see these persistent problems of labor, uh, 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 labor issues in these global supply chains? And you know that even what's interesting about that is you always hear about things like you know child labor and slave labor and stuff like that. And unfortunately, that does happen in some sectors. But the vast majority of problems in these factories are that people are being paid below a living wage, which Scott articulated, and working way too many hours, and usually under conditions that are not healthy for them. Uh, and those things are all related. They're working extra hours because they need to, and they're going to have uh, be able to uh, um, support their families. Uh, and they don't have breaks, and uh, if you work too many hours without breaks, you s they're very prone to accidents and all sorts of terrible things happen. Those are really the big problems that you see in, these, uh, in the supply chains that are making most of the products that we buy. There are some other more heinous issues, but those are usually the kind of campaign uh, issues that people use. But on average, it's kind of mundane, terrible working conditions day in, day out uh, for most of these workers. Uh, and we want to understand why does this continue? Why after decades where we've known this, where there have been campaigns, there have been programs for ethical consumption, there have been interventions by NGOs and companies and even governments and even international organizations like the ILO, why does this continue to persist? And I guess that the argument that we've all made in this room is that maybe we can do better. We can do better by either having states that might be more effective at enforcing simply the laws that they have on their books. All of these countries that host these supply chain factories have incredible laws on their books. The problem is that they're not being enforced. And they're not being enforced for two reasons. One is because often the state doesn't have the capacity to enforce the laws on the books, and often the states don't really want to enforce the laws on their books because they're afraid that by doing so they're going to drive out investment. So one school of thought that people in this room, the, these names are basically populated here, uh, are, is that, you know, let's just enforce the law more. And that, where you've seen better enforcement, you do see improvements. It doesn't totally go away, but one sees improvements. Another uh, uh, argument that people have made is, well, actually, maybe we can just sort of improve the monitoring of these supply chains. So not just have certification or codes, but let's make sure that at least at the private level, since the state isn't doing it, uh, let's have these private groups, whether they be NGOs or the companies themselves, to do their own kind of monitoring. And there's lots of debates about whether or not you should have companies involved or not, what kind of information you collect, who collects it, what do you do with it, uh, et cetera. But certainly there's been a push to maybe we can hold these companies accountable by monitoring them more effectively. And again, Dara, Archon, David, I would say myself, Scott, people have been arguing this uh, for a while. And that certainly helps, but it's not enough. Um, we don't see significant sustained improvements just through private, even more effective uh, monitoring schemes. Uh, there have been other arguments about maybe we have to change the kind of power symmetries in global supply chains, or even arguments about it's not monitoring or policing per se, but why don't we give these suppliers the kinds of capabilities they need, train them, give them technical assistance, so that they're not like sort of evil managers in exotic lands, they're just sort of needy people who need this kind of capacity building, and if we give it, then they'll run more effective and hopefully more ethical uh, 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 factories. And those are arguments, again, that a number of us have made. And I just want to argue that all of those arguments, making the state more effective, making private monitoring more effective, giving these supply chain, uh, suppliers the capabilities to run more e efficient and, we hope, more ethical factories, changing maybe the dynamics in some of the value chains, all of those certainly help, as does ethical consumption. But it's not enough. And it's not enough because of the way that retail and consumption markets are structured. Because the way that it has evolved over time, and this is really something that's changed in the last 20, 30 years, is that no retail firm, so the Walmarts, the 
uh, and any of the other, you know, the um, Best Buy, any of these large uh, companies, no one wants to hold inventory if they think it won't sell. It's expensive to hold inventory. Um, and so what they do is they have very minimal inventory, and what they wait is for us to start, you know, buying stuff, and with that uh, purchasing uh, point of sale information, they have a pull base, uh, it's called a pull order uh, system. So as they see certain products selling and not others, they signal to their suppliers, okay, now we want you to make it. So they signal to the HPs and Apples, all right, now we really, not Apple because they have their own retail, but say HP, uh, we want you to make more of these kinds of printers or these kinds of desktops, et cetera. And then HP signals to its suppliers, okay, now why don't you assemble these markets, these kinds of products as opposed to the others. And HP has tried to organize this by not holding itself any inventory, but holding sort of common modules, common components, which can be actually redeployed in all sorts of different products uh, at the final point of assembly. So what's cool about the Apple products isn't that inside they have all sorts of cool stuff, because in fact the components are used by lots of other uh, consumer electronics products. What's cool is the way that they package it and, and sort of design stuff. But there's tremendous amount of overlap in the consumer products that we buy because inside they are all using uh, common components. And what's interesting about this, as, as I was trying to show in, in, this, uh, in this graph, is that the kind of volatility that we see at retail, like you know, suddenly we want a product and everyone goes in, and then sometimes we don't want it and it goes in like that, these small oscillations of volatility which have been smoothed out by all sorts of log, you know, sort of algorithms and operations management uh, tools. But at the final point of assembly, where the people are taking these modules and putting them together, now I'm talking about, say, electronics, but the same is true for garments, the same is true for uh, lots of other products because no one wants to, again, hold inventory. What you have is wild volatility at the final point of assembly, and that can only be dealt with by having lots of workers work way too many hours, paying them very low wages, and actually using a lot of migrant workers. And so when you really look at these factories, what they're doing is they have incredible inflows and outflows. They hire people, they give them contracts, and then they fire them two, six months later to basically manage this system. That's how the system works, and it originates by our desire to have the latest, cheaper, cheapest product um, available uh, um, out there. And uh, the way that it works is that, you know, again, this is all be, uh, happening because we have tremendous amount of concentration in our retail markets. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you just think about that, uh, the top four, just in electronics, the top four brand, uh, retail outlets basically control 75% of the consumer electronic market. I mean, tremendous amount of power. So we always focus on brands, but brands are also responding to uh, uh, retail. And this kind of concentration of brands and brand power, you see it in apparel, you see it in footwear, you see it in many, many other kinds of, uh, of products. And the way that it works, so this is just, again, this is uh, some work that I did with a group of uh, students on, uh, on Hewlett uh, Packard. Uh, and what you can see is this is just their order of all, this is what they're estimating this would be the average, this would be the low estimate, this would be the high uh, estimate of what they think over the course of 12 months uh, the volatility for um, uh, orders uh, would be for, say, a particular kind of uh, HP uh, gent, uh, inkjet uh, printer. And over here, what you see is what, so this is the kind of prediction, and this actually shows, um, you know, what it does in terms of the volatility in terms of how it actually plays out in the factory. To manage this, you have to hire a bunch of people, and then you have to fire a bunch of people, you have to have them work incredible hours, and then it's really kind of feast famine uh, kind of uh, uh, situation. And um, I think that's it. Um, and so what I want to argue is that um, if this happens, and by the way, um, this happens in lots of different sectors, and the, and the brands and the large retailers are actually admitting it. So even if you read their corporate responsibility reports, which maybe are, you know, this kind of propaganda that uh, Scott was talking about, but if you read Timberlands, they will say it's because of the proliferation of different kinds of products 
and the way that we're having all these samples at the same time and we're launching all these products at the same time, that what happens is our suppliers are making all this product way above their capacity. The only way they're going to deal with capacity issues is not by building new plants or hiring more people, but having those same people work longer hours. Nike admits the same thing in its corporate responsibility report, and a number of other uh, large retailers have done this as well. So this is not a secret. This is actually pretty open information. And so it seems to me that if we know that the way that our consumption patterns are driving certain kinds of retail patterns, which are driving certain kinds of supply chain patterns, which ultimately are born on the shoulders of often migrant women workers in developing countries making these products at very long hours at, and uh, low wages, then we have some sort of responsibility to change that. And I would argue that the way to change that is not just, but that's a good start, to think about ethical consumption and signaling, but maybe we have to broaden our conversation of what ethical consumption means to think about the level of consumption, whether we actually need the latest product or so many products, or maybe sort of following on the Alta Gracia example, maybe it's just okay to have fewer t-shirts and pay more for them so that uh, that works for them and it might work for us uh, as well. I think we have to have a broader discussion of this. And we know, for example, this isn't a pipe dream. The structure of consumption wasn't always like this. If you look across countries that have very different kinds of policies in terms of access of credit, uh, so think of Gunnar Trumbull's work. Uh, he's a professor at Harvard Business School that's done very, very cool work on consumer policy and consumer credit across different countries. We know that these consumption patterns are very different in Germany than they are in the United States. We know that in the United States, in the 1920s and 30s, the last time we had an economic situation like we have today, that 20% of industry came together to regulate the production patterns so they could regulate consumption. They wanted to get away from cutthroat consumption and, and competing on products at low prices and instead compete on innovation and other things. So even in this country, this was it, something to do. And by the way, it was pushed by people like Louis Brandeis and others. There's a great book by a guy named Jerry Burke, who teaches at the University of uh, Oregon, uh, all about uh, Louis Brandeis and regulated competition. So we know historically it's possible. We, possible. we know comparatively it's possible. And I think it's a time for us to start thinking about how do we not only improve enforcement, how do we not only increase the capabilities of these suppliers, how do we not only signal what's more ethically produced than not, but how do we change the basic patterns of consumption and the way that markets have been organized around that in the societies that we live in today? Thank you very much. It's an absolutely fantastic set of discussions on uh, zeroing in on this, this question of how to regulate uh, corporate behavior from many, many different perspectives using a, a set of very <laughs> advanced tools. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions and answers for anybody on the panel, really. So, yeah. Um, I have to go to the microphone. I don't know. If you went to the microphone, it'd be yeah, great. Yeah, go to the mic, because I think it's being recorded. Right. Um, so I have sort of two um, economically business-minded questions, um, just to get a little bit more, uh, build my own intuition. So one is um, for uh, kind of building on something that Scott said. Um, I don't have a feel in the apparel supply chain for if we were to increase wages by 3x to get to that living wage, what would be the percent increase in the, in the price of the product that you'd have to pass through to consumers in order to cover the costs of... Uh, for the companies of that. So in, in a sense, what's the percentage of the labor cost and the total cost? So is a 3x increase in wages a 5% increase in the cost of the product, a 10%, 50%? Like how much as an ethical consumer do I have to pay to get that living wage? And um, a similar question, um, building on Yen's um, presentation, you showed a lot of situations where there was a price, uh, a constant price, but the labels led to essentially changes in market share. So 10% increase in purchase of a product. How much is that? Is that really? How much is that worth to companies? Can they can they pay? Can they afford to put, push more money back in the supply chain if it's going to get them that increased market share? Since it's not, we weren't talking about price premiums, I didn't know how to sort of compare apples to apples in that in that regard. 
Scott, you want to answer? It's obviously a critically important question. And first, the ultragrass example, then a broader point. I'll try to be brief. The ultragrass products are, are all of the cost increases being absorbed by the brand. The products are being put on the shelves at the same price that would be the case uh, if a standard wage was being paid. The actual increase at factory price is about 20% on a t-shirt or sweatshirt relative to what the factory price would normally be. Put that in perspective, in collegiate logo apparel, where there are relatively high markups, the ratio between factory price and, and final sale price is about five times. So if a brand wanted to pass it along but didn't feel compelled to mark up on the increased cost, could translate to about a 4% increase in retail price or up to 20%, depending on the decisions made at various points up the, up the supply chain. Um, more broadly, the rule of thumb we use is that labor cost at factory price is about 6 to 8% of, labor cost is 6 to 8% of factory price. Uh, generally speaking, getting from a prevailing wage to living wage means tripling the wages or a bit more. So you're talking about a 12 to 16% increase on average in terms of labor cost. It's substantial. It's not zero. And there are other factors, and, and Rick's presentation speaks to them, and they're important. It's not just the issue of the price that's paid and the labor cost. It's the need to smooth out production. The commitment at Alta Gracia is not just to pay living wage on an hourly basis, but to pay every one of those workers that living wage every day of the year. They can't lay people off. Um, there are costs associated with that, reorganization of the supply chain to make it feasible. So exactly what the number is is not clear, but, but I'll conclude by noting Nike's profit margins are large enough that Nike could pay a living wage to every worker in its supply chain beginning immediately and absorb it and still have a profit in excess of 10% a year. So it's, it, this is by no means something that's outlandish or unachievable. What's missing primarily, of course, is the political will on the part of the brands and retailers to actually do it. Great. Yeah, and I just quickly answer to that question. I think the, the share, the, so the changes in the market share are very important. I mean, so these estimates that when we showed them to Whole Foods, they got really excited about this. I mean, if you can get 10% more market share, this is definitely something that, that is, is important for them. And I mean, for the fair trade model, at least on, in theory work, I don't think they would actually need to have a premium that they pass on to the consumer because they can pass it down when they just uh, scale it up sufficiently. At least that's what they're saying. I mean, in Europe, they're usually charging higher prices for the fair trade certified products. Uh, in the US, a lot of retailers have been very reluctant to do that because they think uh, that customers are not willing to pay more for that. We actually ran one experiment in Whole Foods stores where we had uh, treatment and control both fair trade labeled, and we raised the price on these coffees by $1. So we went from $11.99 to $12.99 and from $10.99 uh, to eleven ninety nine for the cheaper coffee, and the results there were pretty interesting. What happened was that for the more sort of expensive coffee, which is eleven ninety nine is a regular price, most of the coffees in the bulk coffee section in Whole Foods are priced that way. Once we raised the price, there was actually positive price elasticity uh, for the more expensive coffee. So people kept buying it more. Um, the point estimate was about like like a little bit over zero. So they got really really excited about that. <laughs> On the other hand, there's two cheaper coffees which are sold in the Whole Foods bulk coffee bin, which uh, are going at $10.99 usually. And so we raised the price for them by $1. The price elasticity was like minus three. So sales went down by about 30%, and customers that were previously buying that coffee basically switched over to the other cheap alternative in the bulk coffee bin, and their sales of that coffee went up by about 30%. So there was an instantaneous substitution effect there among these probably segment of the, of the market where they are a little bit more price sensitive. So that tells you, I mean, that it is really a mixed, it's a mixed story, I think, up to this point. Um. Uh, taking Mr. Rock's uh, comments a step further, uh, there was another vector thrown out by a person that was probably a little more ethical than Steve Jobs. Uh, Thoreau ad advocated a life of uh, voluntary simplicity or voluntary poverty. Uh, does ethical consumerism, can it be ethical if it promotes consumerism per se? We have a world now with 7 billion people. It's estimated to be 9 billion by the middle of this century. Certainly we can't sustain this level of consumerism uh, for much longer uh, with environmental problems pressing in on us. Uh, don't we have to distinguish when we're making ratings about the option of not consuming at all? Yeah, it's a great question. It's something that um, we intentionally at the start of Good Guide made a decision not to be basically viewed as a Berkeley fringe <laughs> initiative to tell people <laughs> to not consume. We knew that that, was, that is a tough message in the US. It's one that many other people have tried, including Juliet Shore, 
who uh, contributes to this issue. And we, we think it's very important, and we think it is a critical part of the solution is changing consumer, the entire nature of consumption in the U.S. But we basically are uh, advancing an experiment to take people where they're currently at and assuming people do have to buy food. Uh, they do have to buy shampoo. All right, maybe not all MIT students, but um, uh, they do have to buy certain, certain things. <laughs> Uh, and let's help them find better versions of those things. But I absolutely agree both uh, with Ricky's comments and with yours that long-term thinking about reducing overall consumption, shifting the nature of consumption is critical. Um, it's a pretty tough message to deliver in the United States, um, in any segment of the United States. And I don't know if, if, uh, if Rick, you have ideas on how to advance that message, but it's one that has, um, there have been movements in the U.S. for the last 30 or 40 years on it. They have not done well, um, not, have not grown. David. Um, so I want to pick up on something that Dara said. I want to hear more about it. And you said something about Good Guide also being an on-ramp to collective action. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that one of the differences between what Dara and Jens presented and what um, Scott is arguing is a difference of individual versus collective action ultimately motivating change in these markets. Um, and, and so how much should we believe ultimately that these individual actions can ultimately yield things that we traditionally usually have collective entities, whether they're the government or third parties or unions doing it? And how much is it the fact that we actually have hidden here are two very different pathways towards improving conditions in, in working places? Yes, yeah, so this, this is one where I think Scott and I do disagree. Scott argued that these types of initiatives have the potential to demobilize us as citizens. And our research, and I think also, again, Juliet Shore's research, shows that um, people that are consuming ethically are also more likely to be political actors around these very same issues. They are more likely to write letters to these companies. They're more likely to boycott. They're more likely to take collective action. So uh, in our research early on, we found people do want to solve this first problem. You go to the store, you've got to choose some cereal for your kid, kids in the cart screaming, how do I make that better for me personally, individually? But almost anyone who takes this seriously immediately says, but I, I want to do more than that. I want to do more than just changing my cereal. What else can I do? And so we do, I absolutely believe that there is potential to move from individual action to collective action and to enable this kind of social learning and social action and consumption and really ch changing how we consume through different types of interactions in the marketplace. Um, so our early research shows that that is possible. We are still early in trying to solve that first individual problem to make this so easy and simple and fun and compelling and status filled. We also find that some higher priced products that you consume in public where people see you consuming them, like Jens's Patagonia jacket, he paid a lot for it, but it's really cool, it works well, and he gets status out of that. That's a product where you actually will pay more for a good product. And so we're trying to look at this and see, okay, how do you go from that to then take action on the issues around the environment or whatever that that represents? Anybody else? Or on, on the collective action issue? Or? I just mean, just a very, a very quick comment. Um, uh, absent the, the unlikely prospect in the near term of a regulatory solution to this problem, a public regulatory solution, either at the national or international level, the biggest leverage we have over brands and retailers is the threat of reputational damage. And at the end of the day, that reputational damage, that threat comes down to fear about the actions of individual consumers. But it's collective action that convinces brands and retailers, has in the past, that individual consumers can be turned against the brand. So it's a combination of the two factors, I think, that's been effective. On the ethical consumption front, you can imagine, because I, I do agree, and I think the research tends to show this, that many consumers will respond to ethical labels. Um, and as those labels get refined and become more powerful and compelling, I think we'll see more and more of that. Uh, but that won't work unless there is collective action to hold accountable the companies to the claims they're making and to punish those companies that try to undercut the market uh, by selling ethical, unethical products under, under false pretenses. 
maybe just one quick thing on that. I, I, I think we do agree on this. I think the role of intermediaries like NGOs in bringing together the collective voice of consumers, the way you know, the student movement, a tiny percentage of students changing their consumption has moved the entire collegiate apparel market significantly. A tiny percentage of churchgoers buying coffee on Sunday mornings, switching over to fair trade, has changed the coffee market. A tiny percentage of consumers can really move the market if they act collectively. And this is where, you know, a 10% move in the market to whoever asked that, Jason, is phenomenal. We talked to brand managers at major multinationals that fight over 10 basis points. One tenth of 1% <laughs> each quarter makes their entire career. If you can show them a percent of the market to move or 10%, that is phenomenal. Yeah. And, but you need to have this collective action. And primarily it's been done through NGOs working together to be the intermediaries and the voices of these collective actors or these individual consumers to really make a difference. Last question. Hi. I have a question about unintended consequences. And uh, one of the big surprises working in Ghana and doing research on fair trade was that not everyone in Ghana was excited about this because there are infrastructure investments and if fair trade, for example, or other uh, certification schemes become mainstream, it's effectively another form of regulation and imposing of standards on farmers and not everyone may be willing or able to meet these standards. So what happens if, main, if, if these niche certification schemes really go mainstream and what are the ethical implications of that? Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> That's, I think that would definitely take a lot of research, and I'm very interested to, <laughs> to the answer to the answer to that question. I think the I think the answer is that it, this question is largely unanswered at this point. I mean, I think we just don't know, and it's a very important concern. I mean, talking to people in Ghana, where we're doing a project on fair trade certification, uh, where a company has made a big investment into converting their supply chain to fair trade certification. That's a big concern. I mean, some people view this as the sort of the new imperialism that's happening. It's just regulation that is imposed by us, not by the government, but by these big companies, retailers that are having a lot of power uh, to really change the Ghana. Uh, uh, in this case, it's the, it's the cocoa sector. And so this is concerns that definitely have to be taken uh, seriously, and especially as these approaches are expanding and they're going to scale. This is going to become an important uh, obstacle, I think, that also the fair trade movement, in some sense, has to, has to respond to. I mean, so far, They've been, as I said, fairly small. It's been sort of limited to a few cooperatives that's, that have been organically grown. But now as they're really getting serious and there's major companies signing onto these schemes, they are all up like, against these very, very serious uh, problems. So I think you should answer that question in your dissertation, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add on that, I mean, this, this, there's so many things in the global economy that we don't have good data on and good yeah. visibility down to that resolution that, like, Scott's example, the critique of Hey Now versus Alter is a totally fair critique, and we love it when we get that kind of critique to then refine both our rating system and the resolution by which we can see deeply down to the level of a factory and what the conditions are. So the kind of academic research you all are doing is, is incredibly important to this, if it can get out to the public and not just be published in a dissertation yeah. that no one reads, but that actually <laughs> goes out. So, okay, <laughs> Jens might read it, he might read it. Uh, three people read, three people plus your parents, or uh, whatever. I posted on my website. <laughs> but getting that kind of information, that academics, NGOs, this global no, network of researchers is now, I mean, this is part of the story, is we yeah. can now communicate this in a way that we never could before. I think it's critical. And your work is great. Well, this has been a fantastic panel because it brings together, um, it addresses what is obviously an extremely important and critical problem in the world, has a couple of ideas about how to move forward on that problem, how to actually solve it, and then in an interdisciplinary way from very many perspectives, discusses the limitations of that set of solutions and how we might improve them. And I, I really do feel that um, the panel was just exemplary in that regard, and maybe uh, the Boston Review is one of the few places to have this kind of discussion about how to make progress on the problems that are most urgent to our democracies and our societies around the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.